Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. Um, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, bully, and we are delighted to welcome you. Uh, my name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to be here to introduce uh, tonight's guest, Neil Lankto. Historian Neil Lankto is the author of Campy, The Two Lives of Roy Campanella and Negro League Baseball, The Rise and Ruin of a Black Institution, referred to by the New York Times as a prodigiously researched and enormously important historical corrective to feel good versions of baseball integration. The recipient of the Seymour Medal from the Society for American Baseball Research, he has published articles in Smithsonian Magazine, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Baltimore Sun, among other periodicals. He joins us tonight with his latest book, The Approaching Storm, Roosevelt, Wilson, Adams, and their clash over America's future. That's Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and Jane Adams we're talking about. Uh, in it, he details the early 20th century rift between three of the United States' most important progressives as the country struggled to respond to the global consequences to World War I. What's old is new again, apparently. The Seattle Book Review praises it thusly, the approaching storm brings the reader on a journey whose destination is preordained. However, the people and circumstances that guide the way form the crux of a brilliantly told history. The heart of the book consists of the three robust personalities caught in the middle of a rapidly escalating situation. Author Neil Lankto relates the past with elegance and flair. This evening's author will be joined in conversation with John M. Cooper. His many historical works include Pivotal Decades, The United States, 1900 to 1920, The Vanity of Power, American Isolationism, and the First World War, 1914 to 1917, and Woodrow Wilson, A Biography, which was a finalist for the 2009 Pulitzer Prize. The recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Fulbright Professorship in Moscow, Russia, he is Professor Emeritus uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So let's get right to it. Uh, Neil, John, thank you both so much for joining us tonight and take it away. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Neil, uh, as I told you before we came, came on the air, I, I like your book very much and there's not a lot I can quarrel with. So I, I, <laughs> I, I hope this uh, that doesn't make for, for a dull, dull evening. Uh, I do particularly like the way you did this triangulation that you have the three of them. I think that's a, a, a very, a very nice way, nice way of doing it. Uh, you've got, uh, you've got TR on one side, you've got the Hawk and you've got, um, you've got Jane Adams on the other side, the Dove, and you've got Woodrow Wilson in between. Uh, there's a, actually th those terms, you know, Hawk and Dove come from the 19, 1960s from Vietnam, but the, the idea was there already. And I, I'm sure you saw this, it was a cartoon in 1915 uh, by the, 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 best, the best editorial cartoonist of the time was Roland Kirby in the New York world. And what he's got is, he's got Wilson standing there kind of doing a, a, you know, a shrug, what do I do in the middle? And behind him on one side is Theodore Roosevelt you know, in his full cowboy garb blazing away with two six guns. And over his other shoulder is William Jennings Bryan, who indeed is holding a birdcage with a dove in it. So this, you know, Wilson trying to make, make his way between uh, the two extremes, Scylla and Charybdis. And uh, I think it's nice that you've got Jane Adams instead of Bryan. Although, you know, Bryan of course figure, figures in this story a lot too. So no, I, I, I like very much the way you did that. Well, thank you very much for saying that. And I. I thought it was good to get Adams in there because she's someone who's been so forgotten and she was such an enormously important figure, an enormously important progressive. And I feel like every time I've done an interview for this book, everyone's asked me, well, the first question I have to ask you is who's Jane Adams, mm -hmm. which is such a shame that in the 21st century, she's has been virtually forgotten when in her own time, she was so unbelievably famous and important and influential. Um, and I think, She's someone who was not a politician. If I put Brian in there, then you've got three politicians and she, re she at least reflects someone who's outside of that sphere and who and was purely, plant, her feet purely planted in, in the pacifist movement. Um, and also that she knew all three of, all the two, other two so well. So that was another thing that made her appealing as a figure in this book as part of this triangle. And you can see in this book how she starts as a TR supporter in 1912 with the Progressive Party. 
And eventually when the war begins, the European war, she begins to see that it's Wilson who is a better horse to back, even though she's aware of his flaws, just as she's aware of, of Theodore Roosevelt's flaws. But I think she was very much a pragmatist who knew very much what she was doing and felt that she was going to work with whomever could hopefully get her goals achieved best. Well, I, you, you did convey very well um, that early support of, of, of TR. And it, you're right. I mean, as you point out in the book, she was the most famous woman in America. I mean, she, she commanded a, a enormous attention and enormous respect. Uh, and, but there was always, as you, as you say, there was always a certain uh, lack of comfort um, between the two of them. I mean, uh, TR, on the other hand, he, he backed woman suffrage. He was fine for that. But he said privately that that was not a big deal with him. You know, that, that's just that's just another issue. That was not, not nothing, nothing that he, well, I'd say he didn't care about it, but he, he just he didn't he didn't make that a, a, a great priority. And of course, uh, Jane Addams was always uncomfortable with TR's militarism. By the way, several TR aficionados have objected when I use the term militarist uh, to describe TR, and I'm sorry, if we've ever had a true militarist in American history, he's certainly right up there near the top of the list. He would, he would object to that as he did many times in <laughs> 19, 1915, 16. You know, he would always say that during my presidency, not no American soldier was killed. And, you know, I kept peace and I, I have a Nobel Peace Prize. He, he said that to Jane Adams one time when she was quarreling with him about something saying, look, I am a man of peace. I just, the way I achieve peace is different from Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson tried to use words which don't achieve anything, but I, I in my heart am more of a peacemaker than him. Of course, this was TR's slant on things. So he never fancied himself uh, a militarist, but I think I would agree with you that he certainly was far well, more in that direction. That's interesting, you know, that he, he was fine. Yeah. Good for him to be proud that there was no war, you know, no, no American soldier ever got killed. Well, there's the Philippine insurrection was going on. But yeah, on the other hand, in, uh, in 1910, you know, when he, he, he went off, what, what he did uh, when he left the presidency, which uh, uh, he hated to do, he terribly hated to do. That was the one job that he'd ever had that really satisfied him and could satisfy him. Uh, he tried to make as much space as he could for his successor, William Howard Taft. Uh, and he, he did the, the closest thing he could to getting off the planet, which was he went off on a safari in what they then called darkest Africa. I mean, that the point is, it was it was outside uh, communications. It wasn't easy to communicate, so he was getting himself off. And then he did this triumphal tour of Europe, and gave a number of different talks, which are at different places. Uh, he got an honorary degree from Oxford, an honorary degree from Cambridge, an honorary degree from the Sorbonne, and all of that. And one of them, though, he reflects. He said, basically, it takes a great crisis, a great event, to make a great leader. Uh, and he said that it, once he said, where would Lincoln be if it hadn't been for the Civil War? And he said that full of regret because, no, he didn't have a war under his presidency. Uh, and uh, in one way, more than one way, he wished he had. And I, I think that has a lot to do then with this, uh, this uh, furious uh, feud between him and Wilson, which is there's more heat and passion on TR's side in that than there is on Wilson's. But uh, yeah, that, that's that, that an awful lot of that goes into that, this regret that, that the great crisis, he didn't have the great crisis to make him a great president as, as, he, as he viewed things. Yeah, I mean, he perceived this as the most significant event in the last hundred years. And it was, it was killing him. I think it actually was killing him that he was not president when this was happening and that this man <laughs> who he did not like at all was in the driver's seat. It, it, I mean, I think if Taft had been there too, it would have killed him. But, but I think particularly Wilson, who, who he hated more, so he had feelings for Taft at one point, but, but he just wanted to be there so much. And I think he couldn't be there, number one, and then he couldn't get back in the presidency and then Wilson wouldn't let him go over, of course. So there were all these these terrible disappointments that he he faced in the final years of his life, I think was 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 really difficult for him. It's It's, it's sort of a sad, it's a sad story in some ways these years for, for Roosevelt. I mean, because he's kind of pushing against the tide most of the time until he finally starts gathering a little bit of a little bit of steam and a little bit more support. But in his letters, I'm sure you've read many of these letters as well, when he's 
they'll say kind of sadly, like, oh, I'm lucky if I have 3% of the population following me right now. And then maybe six months later, he says, well, maybe I have a little few, few more followers now, maybe 10% of the country, but most of the country doesn't understand me, thinks I'm a bad person, and they'd rather listen to Mr. Wilson and his dignified talk than hear what I have to say. So I think there's a, there is a great deal of, 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 of uh, sadness on his part that he's just not in the driver's seat and that the people seem to have turned away from him, you know, at one point when the people were following him. And even I think there's a letter, I think it was at the time of the Lusitania where he said, he wrote a letter, I think to, um, might have been Kermit, one of his sons, he said something like, for 20 years, everything went my way, like between 1890 something and 1910. And in the last five years, everything has gone against me. So I think he felt that everything had turned in, in another direction. I mean, his, his life had turned upside down and his health was deteriorating too. So that was another piece of the puzzle that made life so difficult for him at this time. Do you, do you think that um, that expedition he did down to the Amazon uh, weakened his, well, it weakened his health, but do you, how, how much do you think that contributed to, uh, you know, to this deteriorating health and then an early death? I mean, he was just a little bit past his 60th birthday uh, when he died. I how think much it, ha it had to have because you see when he comes back in, in 1914 and all these letters of, you know, of constantly of him saying, I have the fever, I have the fever. And then people are writing him these crazy letters about what he should do. You know, it's like rub pickle juice on your forehead or something. <laughs> I mean, everyone's got these suggestions of what he should do um, for the fever. And sometimes it goes away and sometimes it comes back. But I think that weakened him tremendously. And I think he never quite got his health back 100%. There are times when the press says, oh, he looks good, Mr. Mr. Roosevelt's looking, back fit, fit as a fiddle, but he didn't have the vitality that he had before. Um, and I think he never really quite recaptured, recaptured that. And that's what, what's so also so strange is that he somehow thought he could go fight. You know, a man who was not in very good shape and was overweight. Um, I think he was even an old 50 something, you know, even for the times for, for 1916, 1917, he was an old 57, 58 year old man. He didn't take care of himself. And he had this idea he's going to go over and somehow be in the trenches and doing whatever. Although I think he wanted to die. You know, he wanted to, he wanted to die in action. I think that would, that would have been, a, for him, a perfect way to end his life would be dying on the battlefield and doing what he believed was so important. But well, um, actually, you know, in, in 1912, uh, he took a bullet. You know, there was an assassination attempt when he was campaigning. And um, I've said this, David McCullough said it, a bunch of them. I think he was sorry that he didn't die because he, he went on, he, he was shot in the chest, uh, suffering from shock, loss of blood, but he insisted on going on and giving his, giving his speech. And it's, it, it's, 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 it reads like a dying declaration. About, I have never been prouder. He co compares that campaign he was doing for the, the progressives as uh, like leading his troops in battle. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I think, I think, it's it's horrible to say, but I think he really regretted that he, that he didn't die there because that was the the perfect the perfect exit from the stage, and it didn't happen. It was a little bit of martyrdom, I suppose, opposing him, and it, it 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 would fit. It certainly fits perfectly for for his his personality, his psyche that that would would be appealing to him. Um, By the way, again, and, and dying in action and going over there and, and taking a bullet. Uh, would have been that would have been the way to end his life, and again, sort of show he was more of a man than Woodrow Wilson, I think, too, would have been another way of 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 of, uh, of, of I think, okay. fulfilling that need. You've touched on a couple of things I'd, I'd like to bring up. Um, one, by, by quickly, uh, you mentioned how he was overweight. Mm -hmm. For some reason, he he never never dieted. He he, he ate. He was he was a. a not quite a glutton, but cl close enough to it. And one time there's, you know, that photo of him when he came back from the, from South America, from that. Uh, it's the only time I've ever seen, well, except in his, earlier in his youth, a skinny TR. When maybe, maybe he had his, thanks to those fevers and everything, maybe he had his weight right temporarily. And, uh, uh, you know, eventually, I think in some ways, I think probably his, his, his history of, of, of overweight uh, did contribute to his death because it was it was a, an aneurysm. It was something you know related to the, to the blood system and probably to, to, to blood clots. So that 
The other thing, though, is you, I, I, I like what you said, Neil, when you said proving that he was more of a man than Woodrow Wilson. That's when you get to TR, you get into the history of masculinity and of, uh, of, uh, of conceptions of masculinity. And it's interesting that TR and Wilson are two of, I think, of only three presidents uh, since the Civil War who've been genuine intellectuals. They really were. I mean, Wilson, it's obvious, our only PhD, our only professional academic, uh, great educator, so forth. TR, as, as his, 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 published, his published writings are enormous. I think he probably wrote more for publication than, than any other president before or since. And, and af, at various times in his life, that was his chief source of income, was, was writing for publication. So here's a man who, it, who he knew five or six languages. He taught himself Icelandic as an adult so he could read the Norse sagas and the originals. I mean, this, this is an extraordinarily learned man. And yet he, he picks away, he, he goes in for anti-intellectual stereotypes uh, against Wilson, uh, that you know, both of them had lost sight or much sight in, in one eye. And he said, oh, well, I got mine. It was a boxing accident when he was president and he was boxing with a young Navy lieutenant. Uh, and he said, but President Wilson, of course, he's got it from too much reading. Or, or, that, or he, he, uh, he, he had a term, it's a, I've never seen it anywhere else before. He called Wilson a logo thief or a Byzantine logo thief. Byzantine logo. I, I thought that was one of the things that made me laugh in my research when I, when yeah. they had the new the press going around and asking him what does that mean, and he started spouting all these these different books and go read these books. You'll learn exactly what a Byzantine logo logo thief logo thief was. Well, and then they go back to him and say, "There's nothing in there about, about Byzantine logo. It's just like some weird thing that he picked up on." Right. And, but but he, he said though he said. Wilson, what, what he meant, he said he uses big words to confuse honest men. You know, that, uh, I mean, that, that it, it borders on anti intellectualism and it borders on, uh, you know, it, it, it borders on, it, it, it is gender stereotyping. He, that's, that's what he's doing there. And the, uh, in 1912, the, the stories were getting out about Wilson's uh, relationship, some would call it an affair. Uh, with Mrs. Peck, and uh, TR's campaign said, well, Colonel, uh, Mr. President, how, why don't we use it? And some people say, oh, no, that he was too noble to do this. Oh, no, no, I won't stoop to that. No, that wasn't the reason. He said, I can't believe that, that someone, that, that people would believe that someone who looks so much like the apothecary's clerk could be <laughs> Romeo. You know, in other words, this guy isn't going to appeal to any women. You know, he's not he's not man enough for that. So, you know, th th these these are these are the less attractive sides of TR. I, I know there's no question about that, and it, it's too bad because uh, it 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 sullies it sullies his reputation. Yeah, I mean, there's a letter which I think I quoted in the book where he actually said, "I don't think Wilson's a real man" or something. He actually said that. I mean, it was. But some of it was the his his hatred became so overwhelming. I think during these years that I mean, you, you can just see the, it escalating letter after letter. His his anger towards Wilson um, it, it becomes, and, and you also see, which I think is interesting, because I read the incoming correspondence to Roosevelt, and you see people writing him and saying, like you know, Colonel, you really should tone down your attacks. It it doesn't do you any good, you know. And I think it was I don't remember who one one of uh, of TR's friend said something like, "When you go after Wilson, it's like a heavyweight champion beating up beating up some some little guy." Because people actually start sympathizing with Wilson because Wilson doesn't really fight back, and of course, Wilson strategically didn't fight back because he knew how much it irritated Roosevelt. Yeah. Yeah. He, he specifically said, "I will not answer him because I know how much it drives him up the wall." So Wilson knew what he was doing, but the the more I think Roosevelt criticized him publicly, I think it, I think it really did not help him probably in the long run. I think it. It made people feel he he was it was too personal, you know, and, and he had legitimate differences in policy with Wilson, which he probably should have, could have stressed more tactfully, I think. But I think his his thinking was a little bit uh, I don't say warped, but I think it was it was a little distorted at this time with with respect to Wilson. Yeah, yeah.
what about, I was interested in the relationship of Jane Addams and the Women's Peace Party to Wilson, because they're, they're back and forth. I, 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 think, I think he had some genuine sympathy with them, but I think he was also using them. I, it seems to me that uh, you know this is this is one flank that uh, that he's uh, that he is uh, you know he wants to make sure that he's protected himself there. Uh, Wilson Wilson was never a pacifist. You know, T.R. wanted to make him seem like one, or thought thought he was one, and of course he meant that to totally pejoratively. But Wilson was never a pacifist. Uh, he. He never, you know, I, one thing when I worked on him, I tried my darndest to find maybe some kind of childhood memories of the Civil War and the, the, in the South that had, that had scarred him or gave, gave, gave him these attitudes. And I couldn't find them. I couldn't find them. And that's maybe, no, I, they're not there. They're not there. He was not that affected that way by the Civil War. He was a real enthusiast for the Spanish-American War, the next war that came along. Um, he never, unlike TR, he never thought of going and enlisting. But uh, on the other hand, he was a, a vigorous supporter, a supporter of the war. And uh, when he became president, uh, I think he even had a certain uh, certain Rooseveltian, Theodore Rooseveltian itches there that uh, he was going to uh, intervene down in Mexico. You know, he was going to, you know, he 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 was going to practice good imperialism. And he got burned, got burned very quickly, and. Uh, by and large, learned his lesson, learned his lesson from that. But, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when Wilson was hesitating and debating about whether to intervene, TR, uh, well, as you, as you point out very well, Neil, uh, T, TR was, his, his, his pressure cooker was, was getting even, even, you know, even higher and hotter. Uh, and he said, Wilson, what, what he wants to do is fight feeble war, you know, that, well, uh, he misjudged Wilson badly. When Wilson decided to go into the war, okay, we'll fight and we'll fight with all we've got. You know, that's so, that, you know, Wilson didn't want to, what he did object to very much came more and more was the kind of carnage, the kind of, he called it mechanized slaughter that World War I had turned into. And he's got one, I, I think you have it in there, one, one note memo that he wrote to himself right after he got reelected, uh, looking at the war, it calls it a prolegomenon. And he said, war is deprived of its glory. Well, that's interesting because here's a man who believed that in many circumstances or in the past, war had been glorious. And there were times when he said it would be glorious to die in battle. So Woodrow Wilson was not a pacifist, but he wasn't a militarist either. Yes, I, I, I of course, strongly agree with you on that. And I think he was misjudged to some degree by the by the pacifists and they believed they had one of their own in the white house and, and i think wilson was was very skillful in in working them i mean i think he knew that he knew jane adams was important um there, there were 12 suffrage states number one at the, at the time i think in 1916 so mm -hmm. i think he knew that she commanded still some influence uh, and there were progressives who were who were part of the part of the pacifist movement who might might lean his direction, um, and I think it didn't take much for him simply. Okay, I'll meet with them. I'll listen to their their various proposals, and I'll show interest. And they seemed to be satisfied with that. They didn't lean on him that hard to do something. I think they wanted him to intervene in some way for peace. I think they you know Adams pressed him for that for two years. And of course, Wilson would say time and time again, time is not ripe, time is not ripe. We will do something, but it's not time right now. And they were satisfied with that up to a point. I think there were a few, few in, the, in the movement, people like uh, Rosica Schwimmer, who were much more aggressive and felt that, you know, he's got to do something. He's got to push much harder. We need to push much harder on Wilson. Um, but I think Adams herself was content to wait. And certainly, you know, most of the pacifists supported Wilson in 1916. I think they figured he was a much better bet than a a Republican administration with Hughes and with, with possibly Roosevelt in the background pulling the strings. And they felt that nothing would be accomplished if, if Hughes was in there. Um, but I think that, you know, I think one of my favorite parts in the book is when Adams goes to see Wilson in early 1917. And I think when she has this epiphany finally that, get, guess what? Woodrow Wilson doesn't necessarily feel the same way you do. 
when she's trying to convince him not to sort of not to sever diplomatic ties with Germany and try to find some way out. And he tells her, you know, if we don't get involved in this war, I'll be lucky to, to get into the peace conference through a crack in the door. And I think at that moment, she's like, this is what it's all about for him. He wants to have this influence on the peace and he's willing to go to war to have that influence on the peace. This is not how we think. We wanna find every possible avenue to explore for peace. He's not willing to go as far as we are. And I think when she left that meeting, she realized that Wilson was not the person she thought he was. Um, and I think some, some of the other past was a little disillusioned with him in that regard. Although that's, that's interesting because he did, he did move, he did move for peace. You know, first, uh, right, he had to get reelected, that's how he saw it. And once he did, uh, first he sent that note, which he published, public note to all the belligerents, state your terms, let's see, state your terms. That was the opening salvo in his peace campaign. And then the next one is peace without victory. He lays out a compromise peace. I mean, that was... That was a very, very bold move that he did. And I think he was at his, at that moment, his standing with the past was, was at its highest. I think er, they were absolutely delighted over the moon with him. Like, this is what we've been wanting him to do. And then of course they didn't, no one knew that the Germans had already made their decision to resume unrestricted submarine warfare at that point. Um, but I think there was a great deal of hope that something was going to happen in early 1917, but of course it did not. No, and, and Wilson, that was his preferred, that was what he preferred. That's what he wanted. He, he, he really didn't want to be a war president. PR, of course, did. Would have, would have, that would have been his, his, his uh, fondest dream. But no, Wilson didn't want to be a war president. He wanted to bring about a compromise peace in Europe. Uh, and and that, he, he spelled it out. And interestingly, in his war address, he said at one point, I have the same objects in mind that I did on January 22nd last, meaning in peace without victory. I mean, he, he was trying to, trying, he was gonna fight an all out war militarily, but for limited limited ends. He, he more, more than once said, I don't wanna go crush Germany. I don't want to, you know, don't wanna have a, a, a smashing victor's peace, that that's, that's not right, that's not going to last. So, yeah, he's you no, know, he's he's not with the pacifists, but he's not entirely against them either. Well, here's a question for you, John. I'll turn the tables on you because I've been asked this question. I'm curious what you think. Do you think Wilson could have avoided going to war in early 1917 if he had just said, "No, we're we're going to simply arm the ships like they wanted to do. We are not going to formally declare war." Could he have survived it politically? Do you think? And would the people have stood for it in, at that time? Neil, I think the answer to that is yes, or probably. I mean, we're, we're speculating. The, um, there was no great groundswell for going into war. Uh, Pro-intervention sentiment had risen after the submarine attacks, but I found three different quite independent witnesses who said, that when Wilson went up on April 2nd, 1917 to give his speech, which in which he asked for war, first of all, nobody knew what he was going to say. You know, he, he did that. Believe me, there were no leaks. Uh, three different people. One was Fiorel LaGuardia, who was a second term congressman from New York. One was David Starr Jordan, a leading pacifist, the former president of Stanford. And one was the British ambassador. And they all said, he could have carried Congress either way, you know, that he did have it in the palm, palm of his hand. Uh, so he wasn't, Wilson, for such an educated man, he could also be extremely superstitious. And one superstition he had was uh, that he might suffer the same fate as James Madison. In fact, at one point, when Colonel House puts it in his diary that uh, Wilson pulled down a a volume from this book that he'd done, The History of the American People, and read something about, about Madison, how, how basically how Madison was reluctantly forced into war by outraged congressional and public opinion. And he said, forced into war by uh, the, the irritations, particularly of the British blockade. And he said that these, he said, he said, Madison and I are the only two Princeton men who've ever been elected president. And the circumstances 
run parallel. Well, he didn't want, he did not want to, he didn't want to suffer Madison's fate, which was to be forced into a war that he didn't want. Uh, and he wasn't. No, he, the reason the United States went into World War I was because Woodrow Wilson decided to take the United States in. I mean, he, yes, I, I think, I think he could have, could have held out there. Now that was, of course, the, you know, the, the TR, Henry Cabot Lodge, the, the pro-allied ones would have gone through the roof. Of course they would have. But on the other hand, there was plenty of support uh, there. Uh, several observers thought that, you know, that in voting for war, the, the Senate and the House, most of the senators and congressmen weren't quite sure what they were voting for. They certainly didn't think they were voting for a full-scale uh, land war uh, in Europe. They thought, well, all right, we'll have a naval war, you know, we'll defend ourselves against the submarines and we'll supply some money to the allies and maybe token forces. But no, there, there's no there's no conception of that, and uh, except in the mind of the man who took us into war. If we're going to go in, we're going to go in all the way. Very, it was very surprising to me when I was doing the research how many people did not think we were going to commit troops, as you just mentioned. The, when, when Wilson announced that, yes, we're going to build an army, yes, we're going to send them over, I, I, there, was, there was a lot of, I think, literal jaws dropping. They did not expect that to come out of him. Uh, of course, TR was jumping for joy at that moment, but I think much of, much of the country was very surprised. Um, well, you know, the other thing is, T, you know, why you have TR hat, literally hat in hand going to Wilson and asking to be allowed to you know, raise a division and lead them and, uh, you know, saying all kinds of things, whatever I've said about you in the past, that's what is it like? dust in a windy street, you know, and, and all that. I would love to have been a, a fly on the wall at that meeting. Oh yeah. yeah. I can only imagine how it was for both of them. I mean, it's, it's, it must've been the most, they seem to have had a cordial chat as far as you can, you can tell from, the, from reading about it. I mean, we don't know, but it sounds like it went fairly well as it could go for two men who probably detested one another up to this point. Well, you know, the funny thing, Neil, is at a certain point earlier in, their lives, they'd been, I call them friendly acquaintances. They weren't quite close enough to call them real friends, but they had admired each other very much. And one of TR's great regrets was that uh, he'd been in an automobile accident that prevented him from coming to Princeton when, when, when Wilson was inaugurated as president of Princeton. And they'd, they'd been uh, mutually admiring for a while. And uh, what, what is it, Joe, Joe Tumulty, you have to be careful. Uh, he had a somewhat vivid imagination or recollection. He said that, oh, about TR, he's a great big boy. You just can't help loving him. Well, yeah, I think I, he was not immune to TR's charms. The War Department, the, the, the brass, the civilian leaders were all to a person opposed to TR, uh, TR this TR division. I mean, first of all, as you point out, his health was bad, his military experience was uh, outdated and not all that, not all that extensive. Uh, and plus, they wanted to raise an army in an orderly way, you know, bringing in the draft. Uh, they'd had certainly seen the problems that the Europeans, and especially the British had had, with, with the way they raised their forces and they wanted to do it, do it better, or do it right. And every ambitious young officer in the army was clamoring to get into the Roosevelt division. Of course, this is gonna be the glamor thing. This is gonna get the publicity. This is gonna you know, boost their careers enormously. And this went right down to Dwight D. Eisenhower, West Point class of 1915. They were all angling to get in there. And what, what they're saying, what the War Department is saying, this will just, this will, will destroy our attempts to have orderly, orderly raising of forces. And the point with the draft is to make sure that you're not taking too many people, men, uh, out of critical occupations, to have some sort of organized way of, of keeping a wartime economy and bo boosting up a wartime economy. So, no, this, this was... No, no, no. It, it's I, I. Wilson wouldn't have been human if he hadn't uh, 
somewhat <laughs> enjoyed uh, being able to thwart his great rival there. But it, it was it in his case it was not it certainly was not entirely personal, and I'm not sure it was even primarily personal. Yeah, I mean Baker, the Secretary of War, said he basically he, he said I think it was one of his later interviews, maybe ten years down the line. He said. The decision was made by me ultimately, and I, I made it because TR was simply not qualified <laughs> to go over and, and lead and have any kind of involvement in, in military capacity. It would have been a disservice to the men he went over with, and it was as simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think there's probably a great deal of truth in, in what Baker was saying. He was unqualified, and as you said, the, 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 the army brass didn't want him either. So you combine those two things together, and then you have Wilson himself, why is he going to do him a favor in the first place? All these, all these things converging. Um, and if Rose, even if Roosevelt had been in good health, I don't know if it would have made it much of a difference. He was in poor health besides that as well. I think Pershing later said that General Pershing said that TR was not even in good shape to be going over. So there were many, many, I don't know if TR was delusional and perhaps he was a little bit about his chances. Um, but it seems like it was still very, it was still incredibly crushing to him that when he was turned down. Yeah. Neil, I, I think you are extremely fair to TR. And when I say extremely, there's a little bite in that because uh, I, I think you take, you take a more sympathetic view of him than I do. I, I think his, his jealousy of Wilson and his, his fury at, at being deprived of his moment in history, I, I think was... Uh, not all consuming, but it, it was bad uh, there. The other thing that I was glad to see you point out is that when the war first broke out, uh, he was a bit ambivalent. Uh, Belgium, uh, you know, they're, they're these, day, these days they're comparing it. And you, I said you had a, an op-ed piece where you were comparing uh, Belgium to Ukraine today, you know, brave little Belgium. And of course that was, the British use that as their their excuse for, for getting into the getting into the war. Uh, TR was his first reaction was well, tough on the Belgians, but you know they're just in the way. Uh, you know they're when these these giants clash, uh, and you know he his first reaction he came around pretty quickly, but when he published th those early writings there and it was at Fear God, take your own part. I think that's the the, uh, the the title of that collection. That early that early editorial that he op ed that he wrote uh, uh, wasn't in there. You know, he conveniently uh, uh, tossed tossed that aside. So uh, he wasn't as he wasn't as clear and consistent as as he uh, as he <coughs> as he <coughs> very soon came to think he was. To his great regret. I think he's, he's, again, in the correspondence, you see letters almost every year saying, uh, Colonel Roosevelt, is it true that early in the war you said, you said that, you know, President Wilson's handling the Belgian situation and we, we shouldn't actually, he shouldn't be uh, uh, proposing any sort of uh, intervention or whatever. And he had to always refer back to that. It was in the outlook is, is where those articles appeared. Um, and he, he, his excuse was, well, I was giving the president a chance to formulate his policy, and then once I learned that he learned that uh, he was he was completely wrong, uh, then I realized that I had to change my my stance on Belgium. And I think also supposedly I think when the Belgians came came in September, some some representative from Belgium and came to see him and talk to him. He claimed that was another thing that pushed him in the more in the more direction that Wilson had mismanaged and had miscalculated and wow. simply had not done what the United States should be doing, at least protesting the Belgian invasion. Oh, no, he, 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 you know, he went further than that. He said the, the Germans had violated the Hague conventions. Yes, he did say that. And, and that we had an obligation to act somehow. Well, the implication, of course, is militarily to act under the Hague conventions. He said, what's more? I was president when we ratified those, and that's what I meant. Well, he's, he's either deluding himself or he's lying through his teeth, because that when, when those Hague conventions went through, his bosom buddy, Henry Cabot Lodge, Senator Lodge, had pra to practically stand on his head in the Senate to say, no, there's no obligation under here. You know, we're not entangling ourselves at all. So 
you know, it, it TR had that, some say it's the politician's gift of, of, of believing what, what he needs to believe when he needs to believe it. And that, that's, that's what he was doing. I mean, that, that's, that's the kind of, some of the things that he was doing. And I, as I say, I'm a little less charitable. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think your point is well taken. I think I tried to see things through his eyes when, when I could. Um, his eyes were sometimes not always seeing perfectly clearly as 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 they might. Um, it's uh, some of it. I mean, yes, I mean, I think some of his 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 comments and his speeches were were said through the, the you know they were very much shaped by the feelings of a man who was extremely angry and full of bitterness about his position and about the man in the White House. So I don't think he would agree with Wilson on just on, on anything. I mean, it's very hard to see. I, very rarely do you actually see him in this period that uh, covering this book where Roosevelt agrees with with Wilson. I think when he got rid of Brian, well, when Brian resigned, and and uh, this for those of you who are not who are not aware, watching this, he was Secretary of State, uh, leader of the Democratic Party for many years, and Brian resigned in 1915 after the Lusitania sinking because he didn't like the way the Wilson administration was handling this. Uh, and Roosevelt at the time said something like, I'm really glad, I, I'm, it looks like Wilson's finally going to be a man. Again, that man, <laughs> manliness things. Um, but then he quickly, you know, that doesn't last long. By the way, I want something I want to remember to get in. Uh, I like very much the way you treat Colonel House. Uh, you're not fooled by it. And I, I'm still amazed at how many good historians and good writers over the years have been fooled by House. Um, Jonathan Daniels once wrote a letter to me in which he called him, forgive me for the bad language, he called him that devious son of a bitch. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I came, that, that's, that's my view of House too. There's, there's something, it's fascinating. I mean, the, the fascinating thing is the House-Wilson relationship, that Wilson did have this close relationship whether it was quite as intimate as House thought it was, that's hard to say. Um, one of the problems, of course, is you know that the problem and the great, uh, you know, the great source is House's diary. Uh, most of what we have uh, about the relationship comes from House's diary, which means you're getting House's side of it, and most of the stuff where you go, know, "You're my second personality." You, you, if you're if you're talking to Colonel House, uh, you're talking to me. That comes out of House's diary, you know that. And I'm sure Wilson said things that could be taken that way. Wilson could be quite sentimental in some of his the way he talked to friends and and friends and family. And that House could House could put that spin on it. But House was he 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 very quickly got too big for his britches. In other words, he began to see himself as this, this master, uh, this master of diplomacy, this man who could do all these great things and see himself as so much better at that than, his, than, than, than the president. You know, I think when, you just start, when you start reading, and I, I read, you probably read, you, I'm sure you probably read much more of his diaries. And I only read the period from this book from 1914 to 17. When you, when you read them day by day, and you do get a sense of this person and what he's, what he's all about. And the other thing that's, I found so amusing that the perception of him publicly or that he promotes himself, that he's the man who wants nothing, the man who, who's, who doesn't want, want, want power. He just wants to be of service to his friend. And, but when you read the diary, you see he does have a huge ego. He wants credit. And he, you almost start feeling he thinks he knows more than Wilson in just about everything. So that's that was the impression I started to 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 get as I read more and more. I have a question for you too. Maybe you can answer this. Do you think that his diaries were written the same day, or were they possibly written after the fact, like several days later? Um, usually, as as I as I could recreate this, and Charles New, his latest biographer, has done this. He would dictate this to his secretary, probably a day or two or three days after after they happen. So it's it, it's not that he's not Samuel Pepys. He's it's not and so to bed. He's not going up every night and, and writing it down. Um, sometimes there are some very curious omissions. The times when something important happens. Uh, 
and House just doesn't have anything in the diary about it. Uh, so yeah, he, you're right. I mean, he's, he was clearly writing this, this for the future, for posterity that, that uh, okay, you know, I, I can be this ominous grease now and uh, in the shadows, but someday I'm really gonna come out. And he did, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Most, a lot, a somewhat bowdlerized version of, of the, the diary was published in four volumes. Uh, he enlisted Charles Seymour, then a young historian at Yale who'd been on uh, the Peace Conference staff uh, and uh, had him do what's called, what are called the intimate papers of Colonel House. And others, he doesn't, it, it, he doesn't even you know, wait, to, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't want just posthumous credit. Uh, he, he's gonna get in there and get the credit while he, while he was alive. Uh, and again, yeah. Very interesting man, very, very, very uh, complex individual. And as you said, his, his diaries are, are a treasure trove, but they have to be used, I think, carefully. Yeah. You, know, you can't, can't accept them on face value because of all the, the possible biases built into them. There's one, um, the only time that we have Wilson talking about house. In other words, that you get Wilson's side of it. It's just once. Uh, when he started courting Edith Galt, uh, he immediately he shared all kinds of secrets of state and uh, things with her. I mean, it's, it's a courtship device, of course, to attract her, and it worked. Uh, but she took a dislike to House immediately, or she ever met him. Just she didn't like the smarmy tone uh, of his letters. So Wilson says, "No, no, no. You must understand, dear House." And he said, you're quite right. He is not a mind of the first class. Uh, but he's saying basically he, he's useful and he's serviceable. And you can see that Wilson, at least at that point, was taken in by this, this man who only wants to serve. Uh, but clearly, and interestingly, uh, many years later in his war memoirs, Lloyd George said, pretty much the same thing. And I, I think, and without having read that, that, that letter either, he said House wasn't as smart as he thought he was. Uh, he was uh, a tactician, a negotiator, but uh, not nearly of Wilson's depth of mind. And he said something like, he would have been a good ambassador, but not a, a very poor foreign secretary. So, you know, House, House obviously had, had his limitations and was not it was not as good as he thought he was. Definitely, definitely. What, Neil, what, what do you think surprised you the most in, in uh, what you found here? I think there are a lot of interesting things that I, I wasn't aware of. Um, I, I think the potential of Roosevelt getting the nomination in 1916 seemed, I, I was surprised that it was, even as close as it became to fruition, actually reaching fruition of him trying to maneuver in, into somehow getting this nomination. And, and then even the last minute back and forth where you have these, these very interesting, those, those conversations which were recorded. Um, Roosevelt had a wiretap, an intentional wiretap um, at the hotel. So you have Roosevelt communicating with the progressives, you have the Republicans talking to him and all this is recorded, these conversations of them trying to come to some sort of agreement. And then Roosevelt realizing I'm not gonna get the nomination, but maybe I can be a kingmaker. I'll see who can I can throw up there because the Republicans will follow my lead. He throws up Henry Cabot Lodge, which was not a particularly good idea. Um, just, I found that really, really interesting, that part of, the, of, of my research. Um, something else I found interesting was, was Bernstorff, which we, we haven't talked about, Johann von Bernstorff. And, the efforts that he made, these prodigious efforts to keep the United States out of the war um, and him sort of being the, the one rational figure in the German government who understood that America is this incredibly powerful force and the people in Berlin, the folks back in Berlin basically thinking, oh, America's insignificant, who cares if they get involved? And he's trying to explain to them again and again, we have to keep them out of the war. I also found it interesting of the wiretaps they were doing on him uh, which I was able to see uh, in, the, in the Frank Polk papers. Um, you know, the, I didn't even know there was possible to do wiretaps in 1915. Um, 
I don't know if you ran into this name, your own research of these, these wiretaps, they were, they were tapping the embassy. I mean, it's just, it's really, really interesting to me. I did not know that they had the capability to do that uh, and that the Germans didn't know about it, that Bernstorff didn't know about it. And they're all carrying on affairs. They're all having affairs with American women. Bernstorff's having an affair. A couple of others in the embassy are having affairs. All this is caught on these transcripts. And you even have the, the, the secret service men making little remarks, making fun of their their affairs and what the women are saying, all this stuff like that. All of this was known. It's, it, and House does mention it in the diaries. I think someone went to talk to him about it. And House said, I do not approve of these methods, but they continued doing it. I think till I think till 1917, they, they, these, these wiretaps. But I really did not know the technology existed in 1917, 16 to do this kind of thing. Neil, we've got some questions in the Q&A and several of them come back what what's it like to write one says what's it like to write a book like this and another says a book of this scope i mean, I'd, I'd be very interested to, to to hear your take on that i think it's a massive undertaking and again you you would understand this because you've written large books uh, but i think it's the sources there's there's just there's so much from this period it's, it's almost overwhelming in, in contrast to what i've done before the work i've done before is on the negro leagues uh, and the, the sources are rather scant uh, for that. You have basically the African-American newspapers and a few manuscript collections, not that many. Uh, in this period, there is just, there's so much. I always say COVID kind of saved me because I would have been, I would have been continuing to ply the archives for another three years, <laughs> turning up every possible lead. And there, there are just so many documents. And I really just focused because I, it was out of control. Otherwise, I tried Adams, Roosevelt, and Wilson as my major uh, things where I tried to read everything they did in those years. Even that was was really overwhelming. And the newspapers too, which are are such great resources for this time. You know, yep. every every big city had several newspapers, and they all had different. They covered the news differently. They have Republican newspapers, Democratic newspapers, and and just to read all of them, I think fun to do, but very time consuming. And then trying, you know, trying to put all this together. I always use the analogy of it's like it's like putting together a puzzle which is supposed to have a hundred pieces, but you have five million pieces. It's like, what pieces are you going to use and to assemble and to use and reject? And there's so many fascinating things that you want to use, but then you end up with a 600 page book like I have here. But I, I didn't try to write a 600 page book. I tried to write a book that would tell the story and it happened to turn out <laughs> that long. Um, but to do justice to the, to the subject, I felt it needed to be in this depth. Um, but it, it, is, it is a great deal of work. Um, I think the research is always the more fun part of the job than the writing is the is is the more arduous and I think you know can be backbreaking trying to put trying to put these things together and you know you know you you've, you've written many books and you've I had a uh, I had a scientist friend of mine once asking me how I was doing I said oh I finished the research on it and and he said oh well then you're almost done I said no 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 I <laughs> comes the hard part <laughs> I there's one question here that I I I'll, it, it's directed at me, and let me—I can answer it very quickly. Uh, I, I said there were three intellectual, true intellectuals as president since uh, since the Civil War, and who's the third one? Barack Obama. He is. Yes, he really is. Yes. Um, let's see. Let me just see any others that we're, we're we're just about at the end, but let me see if we can get another get another one in quickly. Uh, Oh, let's see. Gr. This is an interesting comment. I, at at uh, Tr had a solid forty years of living that ninety nine percent of us would love to have uh, in five years of our life. Yeah, certainly. Uh, one of his favorite uh, one of his favorite expressions was the crowded hour. And uh, he, uh, and crowded hour was when you when you live to the fullest. And you know, <clears throat> at the end of his life, of course, the the, the terrible blow was that uh, his youngest son Quentin was killed. Quentin was an aviator, and he was shot down and, and killed. And he said, though, Quentin has had his crowded hour. And uh, by the way, I, Neil, I'm sure sure you listen to every every recording you could of, of all of all three of them. But uh, 
people always ask me, well, what did TR sound like? And I said, uh, listen to FDR. And then kind of speed it up version of FDR because it's that, it's that Northeastern upper, upper class accent that, that they have. And, uh, you know, they, they always said, and they didn't say again, they said again, against, and uh, they would uh, swallow a lot of R's and things like that. Uh, have we got any more? Uh, let me just see if there's anything else here that, uh, uh, let me just go down a little further. Oh, Neil, this, I'm gonna let you have the last word here because this goes right to your op-ed. How do you think these players would act, <clears throat> act today toward Ukraine? Well, as I said I, in the, in the op-ed, I did dis discuss some of these issues. I think Wilson would be comfortable with what Joe Biden is doing. I think he would be quite, quite supportive of that and not going further. And I think Jane Adams would be, but Jane Adams would be saying we need to do more to stop this through peaceful means, find a way to, to get them, get the Russians to stop, stop this invasion. Even we have to somehow get them to broker an agreement or whatever. <laughs> She, she'd be trying to get the United States to throw its power and its weight uh, onto the scales for peace. I think Roosevelt would be advocating a more aggressive policy. I don't know about military intervention, but probably everything short of military intervention. Like I said in the op-ed, it, it all depends on what the American public will stand for. And I think that was true in 1914 with Belgium, where a lot of Americans were very sympathetic to Belgium, but would they have been happy with troops being committed, even if we had troops, which we didn't really have? Probably not. And I think right now it's the same thing. There's a great deal of sympathy for Ukraine. Many Americans want to do what we can do, uh, but there's a limit how much we will, will accept as a country. And then there's political considerations that Wilson had in 1914. You know, how's that going to play with the Democratic Party? I think Biden has to consider that as well. So um, it's an interesting thought. And I think they would be, they would realize the, the seriousness of the current situation and recognize the great the, the parallels. Well, I I think, I think we've used up our crowded hour. <laughs> <laughs> and as I say, uh, I'll put in, uh, Neil, Neil's too, too discreet to do it, but I'll put in, buy this book. It's good. You'll, re you'll really, really enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very kind of you to say. <laughs>